Okay, so welcome to ARC. Uh, a bit of an unusual topic today, but one that's really in Christ. So let's pray first. Father, we bless you. We thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you for the blood of Jesus shed for us. We thank you that it's your idea, not our idea, to save us. We thank you that it's your way and not our way that accomplishes that. We thank you that apart from Jesus, we could do nothing and are helpless and would perish. But we are not without Jesus. We're not without your word. We're not without your wisdom. And we're not without your leading and your direct intervention to save us, even in such a wicked age as this. So, Lord, as we share today, my thoughts, Lord, are with all those who are trapped in a lie, who are trapped in a cult, who are trapped in false Christianity of all flavors because of the list of things that pretend to be Christianity but are not. It's too long to recite. But all of them, Lord, you created those people for fellowship. You did not create them to destroy them. You did not mean for them to exist only as fuel for your fire, yet that's what they'll be, Lord, if their eyes are not opened, if you do not convict them of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and reveal yourself to them to save them in an age where the church widely cannot be trusted to do so and has lost its own way. But I thank God that the shepherd, our shepherd, Yeshua himself, is not lost, nor is your arm too short to save, nor is your mercy, Lord, extinguished, even as time is running short. We pray, Lord, that as many as can yet be saved everywhere on the face of the earth, even those who right now, Lord, are wicked, unquestionably wicked, yet you have turned millions and billions of wicked people into children for the living God by the working of your spirit and your word together. We petition for it, Lord, since mercy triumphs over justice. Why should you not have the bride you paid for? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. So our title today is Scattered, how not to be, how not to be. So I don't know if you're aware, but the enemy has been very, very active trying to scatter every faithful congregation, every faithful gathering. Anything that's really standing for Jesus has been under siege for ages. But now that siege is really intense. It's not going to get easier anytime soon. So instead of praying for how to stop the attack, we need to understand how to not be overwhelmed by the attack, since it will go from bad to worse. What is, does anyone know what Jesus says about false teachers in terms of will they get better? He says they will go on deceiving that's half of it, and being deceived. It's the most tragic thing. These people, are, you, they are always going to be in our world. They not only deceive people, they are themselves deceived. The very thing that they do harm with has first done harm to them. But Jesus warns us, don't wait for it to get better it's going to go from bad to worse. In the end, only a remnant are saved. That's the reality, right? So hence why, you know, I hate dominionism, the idea that the church will just bring heaven on earth. That makes Jesus a liar, if that's the case, because he tells us the exact opposite. He says that in the end, all you'll be able to do is stand and not be scattered. Right? That's, a, that's where it goes to. So our topic today is what are the practical things, how can we endure the things that come and are trying to scatter us, separate us. Can anyone guess why God would not want us separated? What does separated mean? Separated from who? I'll give you a hint, make it easier. There's two equally true answers. God does not want us scattered Scattered is the opposite of being brought together, right? Scattered is the opposite of being brought into unity. 
So there's two places that God does not want us to be scattered from. Don't look for a trick question. It's, this is really as simple as you don't overthink it. Who are the, where are the two relationships that God would not want you scattered from by the enemy? What's the most important one? Himself. He does not want you scattered from him. But there's a second one that's almost, not quite, but almost as important. He does not want you scattered from the body, each other. Each other. Why? It's not in your notes, but it's, it's, it is written that the devil roams around the flock like a lion, like a, like a hungry lion or a wolf, looking for someone to devour. But when, the, when they are tight together in the flock at the feet of the shepherd, he can only anticipate dinner from a distance. So what does he try and do? He tries to bomb burst. The, sorry, that's a, you probably don't know what that means. It's a, he can try and scatter, explode that tight thing into a whole lot of individuals and have them at the same time be separated from the shepherd, for the shepherd to lose control of them so the sheep are going in all directions, right? Now that wolf can eat as much as it likes because a sheep on its own is history, right? And we'll look at that. So how did, it, how did this come to be our topic today? Well, it's, it's really, I always pay attention to what topics God points me to to teach. And then I learned last week, several people, you don't, you don't know that you all told me the same thing, but quite a number of you came to me individually and said, you know, that was the topic in our study the other day. Or, you know, that's the thing God had me read yesterday. Confidence building that our shepherd is shepherding us. Right? So I looked back over the, the recent teachings. Is there, like, is there something emerging? Is he giving us the pieces of some compass bearing, you know, some direction, and there is, and it's to do with this. So we'll pick that up as we go along, but just keep that thought in mind that God has brought us to this topic in steps. All the things he's had us look at, mercy triumphing over justice, the fact that he is just, though, the, the whole study of Peter that we did, first Peter that we did, it goes back as far as that. He's been giving us the, uh, the parts that assemble together into what we need to not be scattered, to be his servants in an age of wolves, to be co-shepherds with Christ for each other and for other people. So my confidence is not because I'm a confident person. My confidence is not in my own strength. My confidence is seeing the hand of God in where he has carefully assembled our understanding to help us be able to not be scattered, to not be separated either from him or each other. And then to go further. Because when we learned about mercy triumphing over justice, remember we focused on the fact that for the time being, he delays justice. He's got his fingers on the scale, remember, tilting it on purpose towards mercy, delaying, not cancelling, justice until he just can't anymore. What does that mean in plain language? He still wants to save people. You know? We haven't reached that point where salvation is no longer really on the table. So for the time being, we need to be conscious of the season we live in, be gatherers, be those who, who work in the opposite direction of everything that's trying to scatter, we should be trying to bring back instead. That means each other, but also those who are missing. For those of you who are familiar with Ezekiel 34, which is one of our core 
scriptures here. Remember what when God is angry with the shepherds and he says, therefore I'm going to shepherd my own flock. I will send my own shepherd. And remember what it says he will do? He will look for those who are missing, who've been scattered, to bring them back. He will gather them back to me. And he will free them and he will heal them and he will anoint their head and he will lead them out with rejoicing and showers of blessing to solid food and clean water. Right? He will save them from the false shepherds. That's the description of Messiah. When Jesus says in John 10, I am the good shepherd, he's not making that up. He's telling the Jewish hearers of the word, I am the one Ezekiel said would come. That's his job description, Ezekiel 34, right? So we know that if we are about not just in our own walk, making sure we are not scattered from him, but understand that as a body, we have to help each other not be scattered from him or each other. And people we've never met yet who are missing, not just missing from us, missing from him, Because some wolf, some false shepherd has scattered them from him. His job description is what we are co-workers in. If he is looking for them, so should we be. If he wants to bring them back, so should we be. If he wants them to have solid food and clean water, which which is a picture of sound doctrine and the Holy Spirit, that should be our desire for them as well. But what if they are wicked, evil, you know? What if they belong to some terrible cult that's hurt us or whatever? Where did God take us to first before here? Mercy triumphs over justice. He'd rather save them than destroy them. Remember, he takes no delight in the destruction of anyone. Which brings us to last week. Or... Yeah, just before. So remember we had a visitor? Thinking, you know, who are you and why are you here? But the whole time, you know, sometimes you know it's a God moment. So that visitor is from a cult. Lovely girl, you met her, really nice, right? But the spirit with her... So I wasn't surprised when she had to leave early, you know, and the whole time I'm listening to the Lord, and he let her, he let us see her, and then he took her away, right? But then they contacted me, and they were like really flattering. That's always a danger, eh? When God never flatters, God is painfully honest with us. He doesn't flatter us, right? Doesn't puff up our egos. So they wanted to meet and they wanted to share something. And you know me, pray first. And it's like, so straight away I knew, whatever you are, you are not from God, right? I didn't know what they were. But the Lord was like, you meet with her, but you must not join. And I'm like, join what? He didn't, God didn't say three times, he said to me, you must not join. So armed with that, without having any clue, because they haven't asked me to join anything, so it seemed like disconnected. Why is God saying you must not join? No one's asking me to join anything. So I decided neutral ground was best. So I said, oh, well, I've got something to do in the mall, so if you're around, you can meet me in the mall and you can buy me a coffee and I'll listen to what you have to say. So when she came, she came with a friend. So like, you know, t- tag team. And I'm like, okay. So we sit there and God's ringing in my ears. You must not join. And I'm like, okay, Lord, no problem. I sat down and then I just let God lead. Well, if it wasn't so serious, it would be hilarious. One sat here. One sat here, you know, like people do when they're trying to sell you a set of plastic steak knives, you know. Instead, what happened? For three hours, they got the gospel from me. 
they, God didn't let them speak what they wanted. Instead, he kept feeding them questions. They kept having more and more questions, and then he, God would give me the gospel answer for three hours. Only at the end, and I really felt like what God's purpose was finished, that I said, by the way, and they go, yeah, sis, didn't you have something to show me? And they're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so the one that came the other day, she's in the human resources recruiting. The other one is a, is a um, what do you call them in the hospital, trainee doctors, house, house officer. She's a house officer at the hospital, right? Both Asian, that's significant. So it turns out, as soon as I open the laptop, she says, look, we want to show you our church. Boom, boom, straight away, I'm looking at Seoul in Korea and like 100,000 people at one gathering, right? As soon as I saw it, I knew exactly who they were. Sinjionji cult, the most dangerous Christian cult in the world. South Korea has a real sad history of generating really dangerous cults like the Moonies, right? So all of a sudden, God's saying, you must not join. I didn't say it out loud, but in my spirit, I said to the Lord, okay, no problem there. <laughs> Definitely not joining us. But then into my mind came everything that he had taught us these last times. And he let me feel his compassion for these two girls who were blind. You know, they are first of all victims. Like those K-pop ones that I pray for, they do tremendous harm to youth everywhere, right? But they are the first victims of the lie that they are spreading, right? So if God can turn the head, he can turn the body because that's what they do. They prey on pastors. They try and get to the pastor to capture the church. So it's like, well, two can play at that. How about we have you guys that don't even know what you're evangelizing for? If God can save you, then maybe through you, many others who you've, you know, can also have their eyes open. So I, so I made a deal with them. I said to him, listen, let's stop there, because I said, I don't know what that is, but I'm going to find out myself. And they said, but we can answer your questions. And I said, no, no, no. I never, ever listen to anyone's opinion about something. I have to go to source. So I got the name and that. So, so I tell you what I'll do. I'm going to go and I'm going to look at what your leader says himself out of his mouth, not what someone else says about what he says, including you. Right? And he says, oh, but lots of people hate us and they said all sorts of terrible things about us. One of the things they hide behind is the COVID outbreak in Korea. The COVID outbreak in Korea, which devastated Korea, began in their church because they wouldn't stop meeting together, contrary to the government instructions. And one person came in there, and the next minute they, it was spreading like wildfire in that church and because they all went home, next minute it's all over Korea, right? So the Korean people hate this cult, but not because it's a false thing. They hate it because of COVID. The flip side of that is they use that an excuse, as an excuse as for why people hate them, that they are falsely blamed for being the cause of COVID. It's like a cop-out, right? So any, any negative press about them, they themselves point to as just being, oh, this is just because of COVID and that wasn't our fault which was later proved true, by the way, you know. So I said, here's the deal. I'm going to look at what your founder, his actual message, and hold it up in light of the scripture. And then I will tell you what I find because, and I wasn't lying, I said, I don't really know what he says as we sit here. I didn't. Well, I've done a lot of reading since, <laughs> is all I can say. <laughs> Here's a clue. It's only been around since 1986. So Jesus went to the cross when? Around AD 30. 
So what's God been doing between 8030 and 1986 that the gospel has only just emerged and, and in Korea, not Jerusalem, right? It's a clue, it's a hint. Anyhow, we're going to use this as, an, not an excuse, as a prompt to look and see where does this lead us. So the first thing is we need to, um, in our, I don't know if that's too small to see on the camera, but our picture there, let's all just, there's two scriptures there, let's read them aloud together, that's our foundation. So it says, beware of, oh sorry, this is Matthew 7, 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Ravenous means hungry, they'll eat anything, right? John 10, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. Remember what we just said that means. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. And when the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it, the man runs away because he has a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. That also has to do with Ezekiel 34. The reason God is angry is in Ezekiel 34, he says the, the, the shepherds are only in it to feed themselves off the flock instead of feeding the flock. They don't care about the sheep. The sheep are just a way of them prospering. So if that's unclear to you, the easiest example is the money preachers. You know, the Kenneth Copelands. And why does he need a big congregation? Because the more congregation, the more money. So he only wants more people in his church because more people means more money in his bank. He couldn't care less about the individual people. That's a fact. Right? A hired hand. He doesn't care about the sheep. So what kind of shepherds should we be? Are you shepherds? You are. Because nearly all of you are parents, isn't it? And remember that in Hebrew, what's the, what's the Hebrew word for pastor? Ro'e, right? Why? Because it's the Hebrew word for shepherd. One who goes ahead, who leads, by example. Jesus is our shepherd, the good shepherd, because he goes ahead, he went first. He faces every danger first. He blazes the trail. We just follow in it, right? So he is the ultimate roi. Adonai roi, the Lord is my shepherd. You all know that psalm, right? So what kind of shepherds should we be like? Well, we should be shepherds like him. We should lead by example. And therefore what he does first, we should mirror, right? Immediately think of all the things he's been teaching us over the last few weeks. Because to mirror the shepherd as co-shepherds, all the things he commands other things we ought to do because he did them first. We are to pay it forward, to use a more modern phrase, not a biblical phrase, but you'll understand what we mean by paying it forward. With the mercy you received, you should be merciful. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Right? So let's look and see. So I decided on the front page there, we just need to understand the day of the Lord because, because of the time that we live in, although mercy triumphs over justice for now, justice is around the corner. Justice, when the, when the scales will tip towards justice, I don't believe that's very far away. Not very far, certainly in terms of human history. I think it's like tomorrow in terms of overall history, you know, next but it's not here today. There's still a tiny bit of human history left where mercy will come first. But we have to be mindful that justice is only delayed, not cancelled. Let's look and see what the scripture says about the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. Joel 2. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy hill. 
Let all who live in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It says in Zion, on the holy hill. So this is Jewish specific. This is about literal Jerusalem, literal temple mount, right? It is close at hand, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, like dawn spreading across the mountains, a large and mighty army comes. That's the army of Antichrist. Such as never was in ancient times, nor will be in ages to come. So that had a partial fulfillment in the coming of Babylon historically. So it's partially this prophecy is partially fulfilled by Babylon, the first Babylon, coming and destroying the temple and destroying Jerusalem and carrying them off into captivity in Babylon. But it's not its ultimate fulfillment. Because the prophecy to be ultimately fulfilled, it has to be at a scale never before or never to be repeated again. Remember what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount? The time of Jacob's trouble, a time of terror that will be unlike anything before and never to be exceeded again. So these two things come together. right? So this is talking about the time of Jacob's trouble and how it ends. Amos 5. Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. Who would Amos be talking to today? Do people long for the coming, for the second coming? What have they missed? The, the second coming is a day of terror. Absolute terror. Because he's not coming as gentle Jesus, he's coming as the lion of the tribe of Judah, the <coughs> avenger of blood, to exact judgment on the wicked. And we go, well, what about me? Well, you won't, well, so I nearly said you won't be there. You will be there. You'll be coming with him. Because the rapture and the first resurrection have already taken away the righteous from the world. And you return as part of the army of heaven with him for the millennial kingdom. Right? So you are there, but you're coming down with him in your, new cre- in your new body, perfect and without sin. You're, as the new creation you are then. Right? But for those on earth, it's a day of terror. But a day of rescue for the remnant of Jacob, as we've covered n- numerous times. That's why Amos is saying, why do you long for the day of the Lord? Do you not understand what that's going to be? He's talking to people who think they're safe. They think that, well, as soon as Jesus comes back, we'll be saved. And he's saying to them, you idiots, you don't know what him coming. You should be glad he's not coming today. Who could we be talking to in the church? All those dominionists, kingdom now people who are sitting complacent thinking that I don't have to repent, I don't have to do anything, I'll just sit here till Jesus comes. And they have, they pay no attention to their own walk because they think that they are the conquering, you know, the, 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 the overcomers, the, all that stuff, the, the whole ego trip. Right? That's who Amos is talking to today. Why are you so keen for Jesus to come? If he came now, you're a toast. Be glad that he's willing to delay his coming. Remember, justice is not cancelled. It's just delayed until he knows he just can't save anyone. There's no one that's going to listen left. Let's look at the next one. Zephaniah 1. The great day of the Lord is near, near and coming quickly. The cry on the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty warrior shouts his battle cry. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the corner towns. 
I will bring such distress on all people that they will grope around like those who are blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood will be poured out like dust and their entrails like dung. Notice what verse 18 says. Pay attention. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. We've got all these churches that are, I keep wanting to say dominionist, but not everyone will know what that means, who are earth-focused, who are trying to build heaven on earth, who think that Christianity is about social justice or getting wealthy or powerful or whatever. That's what this means. Jesus says, what is it to you if you gain the entire earth, everything, if the whole world is yours but you lose your soul in the process? Remember the parable of the, the foolish man that had a bumper crop? He was so excited he built new storage for all his new harvest and then dropped dead that night. That's the setting of, this, of what Jesus says. What is it to you if you gain the entire earth? You gain everything you ever wanted here, but in the course of it, you are scattered from him and his salvation. In Proverbs it says, it's better to be poor with integrity than to be rich, than to be a rich liar. It's the same, it's the Old Testament version of the same thing, Right? Because no matter how successful you are, that's why I pray for those K-pop kids. It doesn't matter if they've got a billion fans screaming themselves hoarse. You know, on the day of the Lord, God will not be interested in how many likes you've got on your Facebook. You know, he won't care how many records you're sold. He won't care how many fans you've got. It won't mean a thing. It won't mean a thing. Because earthly success and earthly things has no weight on the scales. Nothing. Only the blood of Jesus shed for you. Only your faithfulness to him. Only that he says, enter a good and faithful servant instead of, depart from me, I don't know you. We have to press in for what matters not be distracted for what ultimately God's not saying live like some monk in a cave you know slight division but it's worth saying in case you get the wrong idea he says seek first the kingdom of God right in in English that's what it says in Hebrew it means this seek his lordship over you seeking the kingdom means seeking the king so that your head covering what guides you, the instruction that guides you, your motivation for every day should be the will of the king. Right? So if, if you get to that state, then the kingdom, you are, you're a kingdom kid. Right? So now you have what isn't in vain. Now you have what matters. Right? Now it's it, enter in good and faithful servant. Right? So maybe that's cost you a job or a, a, a girlfriend or, a, I don't know, whatever it costs you on the way, some earthly bit of sparkle that you had to forego because it was the sparkle or the solid food, you know. So is God, like, mean? Does he just want you to live this, you know, like I say, in sackcloth and ashes in a cave somewhere? He says, no, no, he says... He says, prioritize this because this is what's going to matter. But he says, but then these other things will be given to you as well. Everyone stops there. Can anyone tell me what the next words in the scripture are? Seek first the kingdom of God and then all these things will be added to you as well. Then the most important words in that entire scripture are next. What are they? And if no one knows, it won't surprise me because it preachers for some mad reason never ever mention them what's the next thing in that scripture see look it up for yourself it says because your father knows that you need them God is not stupid 
God knows you need money, you need a house, you need company, you need fellowship, you need blah, 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 right? God created us and the whole earth, he knows, without food you will die, without clothing you'll freeze, right? He's not saying to cancel one for the other, he's saying prioritise your priority, your thing that sets your compass bearing should be the kingdom, but don't stress over the other things because your father knows that you need them. So when you're praying for those earthly things, when it becomes pressing, begin with the fact that he already knows. You don't have to convince him that you need home. You don't have to convince him that you need provision. He knows. All he's asking is that you prioritize so that you are not the people that Zephaniah is speaking to. Your gold and your silver will be worthless on that day. It will not help you. So as it says on the bottom of page one, the, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 24 and Luke 21, they're the same. Jesus actually draws on those Old Testament scriptures as a big part of the Sermon on the Mount, his warnings about the last days. So they're not only prophecies for Israel in the past, they point to the very end as well. There is much a message to us as they were to the Jews. Over to page two. So justice is delayed, not cancelled. So the first half of page two, I already explained to you. You can read back that yourself at home. It's not quite the details and so important. Other than, I'd just say especially to Mary Grace and probably especially to you, Mary Grace, because this cult... I'm only saying Mary Grace because she's the most recently at university and still has lots of network who are actually the number one target for this cult. So what they, and not only that, but um, where she used to go to youth group at the street. Hmm? No, no, but where you used to. So you've got friends there, right? So if you mention this to any of those friends that you run across, they'll know exactly what you mean because the street was targeted by this cult last year in a big way. So because they're of Korean origin, what they like to prey on is um, Asian youth who are vulnerable. And there's no one more vulnerable than overseas students who are away from home. And then they like to pick on people who already go to church. They don't really evangelize total unbelievers. Because frankly, total unbelievers wouldn't give them the time of day. But so they pick on people who are already in a church somewhere, and especially Asians, and especially students. So hence, um, you might want to pay a special attention because being aware, people in your wider circle might say something and might twig you that these people have got into them, right? So, you know, it's not just us. Most of the... Any church that's like really for the word has been their target, right? Anyway, in the middle of page two, we see the answer. I've asked this question. Since all this is so occultic, why did God want me to still meet with them? Fair question, isn't it? Why didn't the Lord just say, instead of telling me not to join, why didn't he say, don't meet with them? You know, because that's a human reaction would be like, ah, no, no, no. Talk to their hand, you know, not going to talk to you. That's a human reaction, right? So God was like, no, you need to still meet with them, but you must not join them. Why? We see the answer. And what, you remember I said when I was talking to them, I felt his compassion. So specifically what happened is this scripture that you see there, Mark 12, 34. This is when Nicodemus has come to him in the night asking these questions. Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, that's Nicodemus the Pharisee, and he said to them, to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Because what God showed me, I'm listening to them sharing and the kind of questions they're asking. Both of these girls know the, what the Bible says really well. S Satan is also good at quoting scripture. 
But these girls are like this far from the truth. They're like Nicodemus. But there's a 93-year-old man, a lunatic, who's the leader of the sect. He's standing between them and Jesus with his lies. They're like Nicodemus. They're not saved, but boy, are they close. You know, for Nicodemus, it was the teachings of the Pharisees and the example of the Sanhedrin that had him bamboozled, right? He wanted God. He wanted the truth, but he was separated by all that garbage. Jesus had to get him past that. Same with Paul. No one knew the scripture better than Shaul of Tarsus, but he wasn't saved. Jesus had to open his eyes and get him past the lies that were blocking the way and all the lights to come on, right? And he goes from being the worst problem for Christianity to being its greatest apostle. So straight away, that's how I see these two and, uh, and the others who I've never met that are there in Thorndon Key every week being brainwashed. It's a real mind control cult like the, like the Moonies, like Scientology. It's just bizarre. But this, is God saying, just let them burn? Hell no. Mercy triumphs over justice, right? That's our setting. So, bottom of page two, we are reminded about the detail of that. Romans 12, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but willing to associate with people of low position. You can't get much lower than someone who's a slave in a cult. Right? They are in desperate need of Jesus. Do not be conceited. Do not repay evil for evil. That's what just saying, go get lost. That's, what, that's repaying evil for evil, right? No. Because imagine if Jesus had done that with us. This room would be empty. There would be no one here. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Remember what when we did this the other week, this does not mean what it sounds like in English. You can read this and think that you have to see what everyone says is right and do that. Do right in the eyes of everyone. In other words, whatever is right according to the majority. It's not what it means in the original language. It means... In front of everyone, do what is absolutely right, what is righteous. The two are not the same thing. The crowd, the everyone, doesn't get to decide what right is. Right is right. So many of righteousness, right? So in the, it's, it's another example of where English, being a sloppy language, is grey enough that you can take the wrong meaning. So you're not here to please everyone by doing what they say is right. You are there to do what is right in the absolute sense defined by the word. In front of everyone. In other words, don't be partial. Don't be, don't be right in front of when your parents are looking and then very different when you're with your friends, right? In front of everyone, do what is right. Why? Because you are his witness. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, because you know oftentimes it's out of your control, but as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, and I will repay. So remember, it's just delayed, not cancelled. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So what did I do? Well, for three hours, I fed them. 
solid food. You return, you, you return in the face of evil, good. You give them what they are starving for, but don't even know that they're starving for it. The other way I tell people about this is you must, we're told to take up our cross, right, and follow. You have to never view people from the ground. If you, grew, if you view people from the ground, you'll just see a sinful person who annoys you, right? When you take up your cross, climb up on it. View them from the cross. See them as Jesus saw them when he said, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. See them as he did and be moved as he was to the point that he was willing, though innocent, to bear their sins and to suffer that shame and the, the, the shame of the cross and the agony of the cross to shed his blood to save sinners, right? We have to view them from the cross. So over to page three, and I've covered this part already. Is, um, as I said, I, when they tried to show me their PowerPoint, because it was, it's like, I thought I was at a Tupperware party, to be honest. It was like, here's a PowerPoint, you know, here's the product. And it was all just the fact that at these events there, there was one last week, I looked it up, 80,000 people turned up in, in uh, I think it was Malaysia. This cult is huge, right, and it's global. 80,000, and it's all highly, highly staged, crafted like a Hollywood production. You know, and then they film it all, so it's kind of, so for those who are impressed by, in my trade we call it production value in the film, um, I don't know what they call it, bling, you know? the bling value of the image. Well, that's what suckers people, right? Because it looks like well, heaven on earth, you know? And then there's, when you see 80 or 100,000 people bowing down to what is actually a 93-year-old farmer who never, who's never been trained in the scripture, who just had a vision. He thinks, you know, um, I don't want to get too much into the cult, but you know the angel that's showing John everything in Revelation? He thinks he's that messenger. And that since the Revelation in the Bible, that God has shown him what was sealed at that time. Because remember, part of it is sealed. The angel tells John to seal some of it up because it... So his claim is that he has already seen the whole of Revelation unsealed. So I didn't mean to go down this route, but, but you already are going like, what? But for, if you were to encounter one of these people and they said that, right, what is the simplest weapon you have to shut that down? It's this. You know the things that are sealed until their time, right? cannot be unsealed until their time. Why? The why is what crushes this cult. What happens as each seal is broken? The things sealed that even John is not allowed to... When they're open, what happens? What is written takes place. So if he has seen the whole of it unsealed, that would require everything in it to have already taken place, which would mean what? That Jesus would already have returned. That Satan would already be in the lake of fire. Well, I don't know about you, but I watched the news this morning. I'm pretty sure Satan's not chained in the abyss already. You know? It's beyond ridiculous. But for those, but the only reason you know that is because you're lovers of the truth, you have the sword of the spirit. You know, you can, remember the sword is a two edges. 
it's defensive. So when that lie comes, you can cut it down with the truth, like we just did a second ago. What's the other side for? On the backswing, so it's not just for defense, to save yourself from that attack. It cuts the other way as well. The same scripture, swing it the other way. Swing the sword at them to free them. Cuts down the lie coming at you. The same sword, the word, is designed to work been swung the other way as well. Two-edged sword, right? Anyhow, on our topic of why does God, why did God ask me to meet with him? We come to Genesis 50, verse 20. So this is, these are the words of Joseph. So whenever you hear Joseph talking, you know it's about the first coming, right? So this is because Jesus at the first coming where mercy triumphs over justice. He's prefigured by Joseph. And his brothers, what did his brothers do to him? So he came for their good, right? Their father sent him for their good. How did they respond? They were jealous. They didn't like it. They didn't want to listen. What did they do to him? They thought they killed him. They thought he was history, right? And they put him down and they put him under the earth. Did he stay there? No, he came up, right? Was there money involved? How much? 30 pieces of silver, right? He's ransomed for silver. He's sold for silver to the enemy. He's betrayed for silver, right? So he goes in the ground, he comes up, he's been betrayed for silver. Those he came to rescue, his own brothers, representing the Jewish people, reject him, and he ends up among the Gentiles. Who makes up most of the church today? Gentiles, right? So when the Jews largely reject him, not completely, largely, he ends up amongst the Gentiles. How do the Jews get the gospel today? through Gentile missionaries. What, ha what is this about? This is when there's famine in the land. They're all dying of famine, right? His father sends them, because he's heard that there's a man in Egypt who's willing to give grain, Egyptian grain. So they go, and at the first coming, do they recognize their own brother? They do not. At the first coming, they don't recognize him. Right? What does he say? Go back, get your father, bring him, come back a second time. When they come back the second time, so at the second meeting, what happens? They realize, oh my God, it's you. And now their father, who they told, they told the father that he was dead, but now he's there witnessing his own son, who the, the rest said was dead, is alive. Not only is he alive, what does he turn out to be? He, turn out, he turns out to be their saviour. But it's his place in the Gentile world. Remember, he's elevated in Egypt to be second only to Pharaoh in power, right? He has control over all the grain and Pharaoh will back any decision he makes about them. So he's able to give Egyptian grain to the Jewish people and save them. God uses the place he gives him in the, in the Gentile world to become the ultimate saviour of his own brothers, the Jews, who rejected him and didn't recognise him at the first coming. Joseph is a picture of all that. So this scripture here is when they recognise him at the second coming and they're terrified. Remember what it says in Zechariah? They will weep. Uh, sorry, they will. Um, they realise that they ha they are responsible. That they look upon the one that they have pierced and weep as one weeps for an only son. They are expecting God's vengeance, right? And instead, when they cry out to Jesus, instead of the vengeance they are expecting, because they they, you know, by rights, by pure justice, 
God should destroy them, right? Instead, the very one they tried to kill turns out to be their salvation. And there he is, exalted by the Gentiles, even while his own people reject him. It's a picture of Jesus, right? That's what's happening in the scripture. And let, So this is Joseph talking. Genesis 50, verse 20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what has now been done in the saving of many lives. You intended it for harm, but God intended it for good. That's what the Lord brought to me about these girls. Satan intended them coming to us to harm us, but God let them come for their good. You know, we could easily just say, well, just go die. You know? No. Christ in us is like Joseph. We recognize that Satan will always do send people who are blind, who don't understand. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. To harm us. Our real enemy is not human. Remember what the, what the apostle said? Your enemy is not flesh and blood, but powers and principalities, right? The spirit that is them enslaved is our enemy. The cult itself, the spirit behind the cult, is our enemy and means us harm. But they're just slaves of it. They don't know they're slaves of it. You know? So what the enemy intended for evil, God is able to make it for their good. And may he do so. And as I said here, that's just a sign of the age we're in. So this lesson isn't just about Sinjianji cult, you know. We don't need to know all the ins and outs of that. But we do understand we're going to see more of this kind of stuff going on everywhere, not just with us, but the people we care about. We just have to accept that that is the world we are now in. So, at the bottom of page 3, I've repeated Matthew 7 and John 10, the ones we read from the picture on the front. We're just going to repeat the second one, though. John 10, the hired hand is not the shepherd. He does not own the sheep, but when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it, and the man runs away because he's just a hired hand and doesn't actually care about the sheep. Too many pastors are like that. Not us, not you with your kids, not you with each other. Remember, a pastor goes ahead. You are influencing somebody all the time. Someone is looking up to you, whether it's your kids, your friends, your workmates, each other. You cannot help but be an influence. The only choice you have is whether you're a good influence or a bad influence but you do not have the option of not being an influence. You are a pastor in the proper meaning of that, whether you like it or not. We are a priesthood of believers. The idea that the guy at the front is the priest and everyone else is the congregation is not biblical. We, the body is the priesthood, right? If the shepherds run, the flock will be scattered. Well, that flock can be your kids. That flock can be your family. That flock can be this fellowship. doesn't matter what, which flock you're talking about. If the shepherds run, the wolf will scatter them and you will struggle to get them back. Right? So our, our first calling is to not be scattered. Our first calling is to stand. Our second calling is to not just stand selfishly, but then to look for those who have been scattered to bring them back as well. That is the job description of Messiah, that we are co-workers with him. If you, don't, if you haven't understood it, Ezekiel 34, look it up. Okay? 
So page four, Matthew 24. So this is from the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, At that time, many will turn away from the faith and betray and hate each other. Many false prophets will appear and deceive many people, including this guy, Lee Manhan, his name is. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Verse 13 could also have been written, the one who refuses to be scattered will be saved. You just don't let the wolf scatter you, neither from Jesus or each other or from the rest of your brothers and sisters around the world. I nearly thought I was standing in front of Roa. My favourite saying to, to Roa, our sister church in, in Bulacan there, is this, one father, one family. It doesn't matter a jot that they're a tiny little church thousands of miles away from here that I get to see once a year if I'm lucky. They are as much family as is every other Christian in every other place on the face of the earth. One father, one family. Jesus says, do not call anyone on earth father. You have one father. That's why we call each other brother and sister. That's why Christianity doesn't have an ethnic basis. You know, we have different cultures. The roots of my culture is Norway. Most people in here, it's the Philippines. Samoa, right? The girl that came the other day, she's Malaysian. Her friend, I think it's Chinese. And so on and so on. Does that make the tiniest difference? No. No. There's only two kinds of people on God's rainbow of ethnicities. His children and those who are not his children. That's it. All right? That's it. The only place that race or ethnicity has any extra meaning is the Jews. Because there are some specific promises to the Jews that are specific to them that God will keep. That's part of why there's a millennial kingdom. Because there are Old Testament prophet promises to the patriarchs that God will still keep. Once he speaks, once he promises, it says in the scripture, am I a man that I should lie or like man that I should promise and then not do it? It's a rhetorical question. He means he can't lie and he can't break a promise. So having promised certain things specifically to the Jews, at the second coming, God finishes all those promises as part of the millennial kingdom, right? He doesn't take us straight away to the new heaven and the new earth until there's nothing left that he has promised that he has not fulfilled in any of the nine covenants that are in the Bible. All. It says in the scripture, as many as are the promises of God, how does it end? They are yes and amen in Jesus. Therefore, we say amen. Right? As many as are the promises of God, that goes all the way back to Genesis 1. We might think, oh yeah, but there's a new covenant now, it makes no difference to God. If he promised it, even if he promised you something and it really was from him, what makes it, uh, what makes it an indestructible promise is not that it was promised to you, but the one who promised it. Right? As many as are the promises of God, they are yes and amen in Yeshua. He is the guarantee, the sovereign guarantee, that his promises will be 100% fulfilled. Old Testament and new. And personal, if those are really promises from him. If God makes someone a personal promise, it has the same weight as any of the Old Testament prophets. Why? Well, I'm, I'm not like an Old Testament prophet. Yes, so what? The weight isn't who it was promised to. The weight is who promised it. Okay? We move on. 
we see in Matthew 24 a direct connection between the explosion of false teachers and their deadly doctrines and the increase of wickedness. Strictly in the Greek, the word is anomoi, which means no law. So the best translation is lawlessness. Wickedness is a bit subjective, but lawlessness is easy to understand. It means like there's anarchy, no law. And look what's happening in our society. Anything, especially morality, right? The government are passing laws that make it lawless. And anyone who dares to say, but that's not right, in other words, you want, a, you want some kind of law, like this is right and that's wrong, you're doing hate speech, you know? But the spirit at work in the, in the government has got nothing to do with politics. It's this, right? Lawlessness ends up becoming the normal state of the whole world. Lawlessness. Right? No fear of God. No fear of consequences. Lawlessness. And as a direct connection, it says that the love of most go cold. You can't go cold unless you were once hot. This is about those who fall away from the faith. Why do they fall away from the faith? What's the connection between lawlessness and you falling away from the faith? What do Christians love? Righteousness. What do we love? Morality or immorality? Morality. But when the whole world becomes immoral, how will you react? Disillusion. And if you're in a dominionist church that promised heaven on earth, that promised that the church would triumph, so what are you expecting? You're expecting the whole world to become moral. You're expecting the whole world to become Christian. You're expecting heaven on earth. And then, not what you thought, but what God said happens instead. And instead of heaven on earth, it's hell on earth. Instead of God's word triumphing, it's every kind of lie, even idiotic ones, being bowed down and worshipped and pushed forward is what you should swallow. It's the disillusion that kills you. It's a di keep that in mind because I'm coming back to that in a sec. Jeremiah 23, which is a messianic prophecy. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away, and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares the Lord. Do you do not want to be Benny Hinn or Kenneth Copeland or this Korean guy? Jesus says, those who gather with us are ours, but those who scatter are not with me. He's quoting this Old Testament. Judgment is delayed, not cancelled. You do not want to be those who scatter the flock with false teaching, false prophecy, which results in what? Coming back to what I just said, false expectation. When you pump people full of the hypey over-promise and you know, heaven on earth stuff, when you build up their expectation that their whole life is going to be healthy, wealthy, prosperous and you know, and Satan's going to flee from you and the world will just get more and more Christian and then there'll be heaven on earth. Right? When you are pumping them full of that, why? Because that's what their ears want to hear. That brings more people to your church, that brings more tithes, that gets you a bigger car and a bigger mansion. Blah, blah, blah. What's God think of that? He just told us. Woe to those shepherds who scatter. Why? Because the disillusion that happens when what God has spoken turns out to be what happens instead of what those shepherds promised. For someone who's totally sold out to it, it's their life. So when it explodes, when the opposite happens, it's like dying. You can't think of a reason to live. Has, is God not real? Has God died? Has, God, has Jesus been defeated? That's what happens inside them, right? And their love, their, their agape, their ability to keep obeying dies with them. 
they go cold, they fall away. Hence God's fury against false teachers, false prophets, false shepherds. But do you see the same tone there? The shepherds that run away, the shepherds that don't really care about the sheep? You don't want to be that. And we won't be. So here he says, and you'll recognise, once you read Ezekiel 34 again, you will recognise Jeremiah 23 as its echo. It says, I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and I will bring them back to their pasture. There they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing. That's really important. Nor will any be missing. Remember what we've, he's been teaching us, how he foreknows everyone that he is able to save. Everyone who will make the free will decision to be his. He knows in advance who they are. None will be missing. He delays the day of the Lord until there's no one left to save other than the remnant of Jacob and they're a special case. They have their own story, right, in the scripture. Jesus will not leave anyone behind that, is, that God says is able to come. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David, meaning his royal line, a righteous branch. Who's that? Jesus, he's the righteous branch. He is the one that grows up from the stump of Jesse. Again, God had us learn that just the other week. You see what I mean? That he's been putting the, our understanding, all the pieces together. It's not written here, but what is the word for branch in Hebrew? It's netzer. It's the root word of the town, Nazareth, Nazareth. So he's born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. The bread of life appears out of the house of bread, Bethlehem, Bethlehem. But he will be a Nazarene. He will be the righteous Netzer. See, nothing accidental in Jesus where he was born, where he lives. He is the righteous branch. He's the righteous branch. So Jesus, the true vine that springs up from the stump of Jesse, a king who will reign wisely and do what is right and just in the land, Messiah. In his days, I, I, I'm tempted to give you a homework test, but I'll, I'll give you the answer instead. Verse 6, look at it closely. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. Well, you can see the answer written after it. Judah and Israel. Are these two separate people? No. Who's Israel? Israel is what God calls Judah when Judah repents. Remember? Yehuda, Judah, wrestles with Jesus all through the night at Penuel. And as the light is about to return near the second coming, God breaks him at his strongest place. That's what the time of Jacob will do. And God overcomes him there, but not to destroy him, to save him. And when he, when he repents and humbles himself before God, he forever walks with a limp. He never gets that strength with which he resisted God back, right? But now he walks dependent on God, and God says, I'm giving you a new name. Israel, which means he wrestled with God and God overcame. Right? Now read verse 6 again, and you'll understand it. He says... Judah will be saved. How? By repenting. And all Israel will be saved. It's the same people. When Judah is saved, God calls them Israel. 
This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord our righteous Saviour, Yehovah Sadek, Yehovah Sadek, Jesus our righteousness. That's his name in this context. That remember, it's not a name like it. Remember Shem. So he say, and the one who will fulfil this. The aspect of God's total sham will be this. The Lord, the King, in righteousness, your righteousness, the standard of what is right. Your example, your mould, your model to be conformed to. It's he who expresses that part of God's overall character, which is Christ, of course. He is the one who fulfills Jeremiah 23. So the false shepherds scatter the real, shepherd, the real shepherds, co-working with Jesus, regather those who are missing in order that they should come back and follow the real shepherd in order that Judah should be able to be called Israel. Right? Israel. We have an, an example from the New Testament that we have to be mindful of, and that is Matthew 26. By the time of Matthew 26, the number of Jews still following him, like literally at his side, in the gospel story has shrunk from hundreds to just maybe 70. The rest have gone home or turned back, especially when they realized that it wasn't just going to be free food and endless healings. Right? And then when he tells them that just how hard it's going to be to be a disciple. And they start grumbling and he says to them, don't you want to leave me as well? How does Peter answers for them all? But by now it's just this tiny group. Peter answers for them all and he says, to whom else would we go? Yours are the words of life. We know that you are the Messiah. The same thing happens Remember when it says that because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most, meaning the majority, will go cold, they'll stop following. When the, when the rubber really hits the road, when it gets tough, most will turn away and go home. And the remnant, he'll say, don't you want to leave me as well? What are we going to say? No, Lord. To whom else would we go? Y yours are the words of life. We know that you are the Messiah. There is no other salvation. So no matter how hard it gets, we will not be scattered from you. But what happened? Were they scattered? Yes. When the, when the temple guard came to arrest Jesus in the garden after being betrayed by Judas, incidentally, going back to the story of Joseph, who sold Joseph to the merchants? How he ended up in Egypt. What was his name? Judah, right? Okay. How do you say Judah in Aramaic? Judas. The one who took the silver in the Old Testament took the silver in the New Testament. You see, it's deliberate from God, so we understand that the one story informs us about the other. Right. So what, Ju what, Jude what Satan intended for evil through Judas the first time and the second time, the first time turned out to be salvation for them in the end. The second time it will also turn out to be salvation for them in the end. Okay, salvation for them in the end. But in that moment, when the temple guards there and they're arresting and they drag him off, to be interrogated and examined, which you all know from the Passover story is the lamb being examined for defects. So even that is part of God fulfilling his law. What happens to the disciples? One in particular says, not me, Lord, I won't run. They'll have to take me with you. Not me, Lord, I won't falter. You'll never see me running away. Who am I talking about? Peter. What did he do? He ran like a baby, right? 
But what does Jesus say to him? What does Jesus say to him? He says, before the cock throws three times, three times, you all deny me, right? He says, but afterwards, I will restore you and you will become a shepherd of my people. Gather back my people. Gather them back from where they were scattered. Because remember, they all ran in, into the night. Right? Why? Because God has to have us understand that we can't stand in our own strength. But he knows the thought and intent of your heart. He knows that those like Peter were like, not me, Lord, not me. There's no way I'm going, no, no, not me. Don't be surprised if he shows you your own weakness by having you fail at your point of greater, what you think is your greatest strength and then turns around and saves you so that ever after you will walk quietly at his side knowing that it is he who has saved you, not you who has saved yourself that the shepherd was sent for the sheep and you are the sheep, right? At the bottom of page four, we see this chain of events. The false, the false workers come and attack the word of God with false doctrine. What is the word of God in person? Jesus. When they attack the word, they are attacking Jesus himself, Right? So the false teachers and the false prophets, people say, oh, they're attacking sound doctrine. Yep, that's true. But more importantly, in spiritual terms, in the heavenly warfare, they are launching an assault directly on Jesus, right, in your life. He's the word. He's the shepherd. When the shepherd is struck, the sheep are scattered. That's what the scripture says. When the word is struck... The sheep are scattered. That's why you'll never hear me stop going on about false teachers and false prophets. They are the, the stick with which Satan beats on the shepherd to get us out of his grip. He won't let us go, but we are able to run. Remember? You being lost from him will never be his idea. No one can snatch them out of my hand, but you can leave. No third party can snatch you out of his hand, but you, of your own volitional will, can leave. He won't let you go easily, but if you persist in leaving, he'll let you go. Right? Hopefully not for long. Remember when, when, when Paul talks about a particularly troublesome person, he says, I've handed him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. What does that mean? Just simple. Sometimes God will let someone go for a time, like the prodigal son. You know the parable of the prodigal son? What did the father do? He said, sure, here's your share of the inheritance. Go off into the world. And uh, by the way, see you later. Because he knew what was going to happen. You know? So God will do that to people. That's why you never give up on backsliders. Just, just pray that God will crush their idols, that he will bring them to their senses as the prodigal son was brought to their senses because when he comes home, what's he expecting? He's expecting that if, he, if the father will accept him at all, he'll be probably the lowest of the servants sweeping out the, the dung out of the cow sheet or something, you know? Instead, what happens? The father doesn't even wait for him to get home, but runs up the road, rejoicing, right? God will do that in people's lives, backsliders. If, you know, if in his grace they will listen. So when you're praying for a backslider, pray that God would destroy the lie, that he would crush it, you know, in order that like Gomer and Hosea, they would say, I was better off with my real husband. You know, that the lie would fail them, you know, and that they would come running home because they'll find Jesus running up the road to meet them. What else do we need to know here? 
think there's a uh, the rest of page four. I think you can manage yourself. Nothing complex there. So now we get to our last our last part, which is practical tools. How can we practically not be scattered? What are the things we can actually do, like actual tools? So let's look. So remember how God recently brought us to understand First Peter, including First Peter five. Be shepherds of God's flock, which is under your care, watching over them. Not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. So you have to lead by example. Not shouting with a stick, right? And when the chief shepherd appears you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. So people think, oh, this is just a message to pastors. But as you know, no, it's not. It's a message to every Christian. You are the priesthood of believers. Everyone is someone's pastor. Everyone is someone's shepherd. And if you're a parent, then it's real easy to work out who that primarily is, right? But also to each other. Why did Jesus command us to wash each other's feet? If anyone wants to come up and take my boot off and hold it in their hand, they have a death wish. Because I wouldn't want to be anywhere near my feet. You know? What does he mean? We must be active in helping each other keep, our, keep their walk clean. Their feet clean. Con the feet represent the part of you that contacts the earth. So we are in the world, but we're not of it. But we become... You know, just being in it, having to rub up against the world and unsay, you know, it, it sticks, right? So part of the purpose of fellowship, why we mustn't be scattered, is you need the encouragement of either their words and their deeds or sometimes, or more often than not actually, just the example of your Christian brothers and sisters to inspire you and to encourage you and to empower you to be clean, to take a regular bath. Because, you know, again, why the once saved, always saved nonsense is so dangerous because it gives people a mindset that I'm saved, full stop, job done. And so they're largely unconscious to the ever increasing effect of being in the world is having on them, and if they were to ask someone else, do I seem Christian to you? They'd go, not really. What? What do you mean? Right? Love delights in the truth and hates evil. So we gently, patiently, with the word, correct each other for each other's good. So we, you know, these days you'd probably say, we make sure we are a positive influence as shepherds of each other towards righteousness, right? So the first thing is we need to be this kind of shepherd that Peter's talking about, including the things I highlighted next. As servants, not for personal gain. It costs you to be a shepherd. Your motives cannot be your own benefit. It costs to serve. So... In English, instead of pastor and things, they, it, in the Middle Ages, it got translated to this word minister. Right? So people who minister, a ministry, and then ordained priests that they would call ministers. Right? What does that word mean? This might surprise you. There's another word in English that you all know and it comes from the same root and has the same meaning. And that word is minimum. Minister and minimum have the same root meaning in Greek. Right? Jesus said, whoever wants to be great must be the least among you, the servant of everyone. So minister is actually a good translation. But people forget what minister and means. It means the least. 
the servant of everyone. Right? But as you give, so shall you receive. We Again, what God taught us, right? With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Nothing to do with money, remember? Or well, virtually nothing to do with money. The real shepherds are servants. The real shepherds are motivated by the need of the other person more than their own need. They, meet, they, they cater to their own selfish need, which for them... There's no greater selfish need than to be a fruitful branch. There's no greater need in them than to be in agreement with Christ about this person in front of you. And therefore, even if it costs you time, annoyance, you might have to put up with a lot of baloney for a while to, you know, to, st- to walk side beside someone who's not going to get it straight away. Being a real Christian is not profitable in the way that hum, un, unsaved humanity talks about a, a profitable enterprise. It's costly. Right. But whatever it costs you, it's sure a drop in the bucket compared to what it costs Jesus to make it even possible. Right. So remember, he, he'll never be in your debt. But we're privileged to be able to follow in his footsteps. So as servants, not for personal gain. Leading by example. That's the 80-20 rule. Like if you're a parent or whatever, you can say the truth, but if you don't walk the truth, you'll be lucky if you see any impact on those you're wanting to impact at all. Human beings, whether it's your own kids or just each other, are vastly more impacted by your example than by your lecture. And if they see that you yourself don't do what you are telling them to do, can you blame them for not doing it either? So we have to lead by example. Remember, Jewish shepherds walk ahead of the flock. They go first. Jesus is the first fruits of the covenant. He goes first in everything. Even the cross. He went on the cross, but we're told to take up our own cross. The whole, the narrow way leads right through that cross. And again, it's not just the pastors, it's a body ministry. Hebrews 10, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, washing each other's feet. Not giving up meeting together, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. Look what it says next. And all the more as you see the day coming. The the closer to the end, he says, all the more. You remember when we studied the the rules of Hillel for Midrash, for understanding scripture? Remember that? Well, you probably don't, but remember the rule, cull the homer, light to heavy. Which means if something is good in a light situation, it's critical in a heavy situation. Whatever is profitable in a light situation becomes essential in a heavy situation. This is an example of Calvahoma. This is the writer to Hebrews saying, it's always been important to fellowship when things were good and easy. It's always it's been important to fellowship when things are good and easy. But when it ain't good and it's not easy because... The day is ending and the night is coming. When, when lawlessness is the normal, then what was good becomes essential. But the temptation will be to give up, disappointed, disillusioned, and stop fellowshipping or find all the excuses why you'll only come now and again or what, you know? You say, oh, yeah, but look, look, what's the point? What's the point? What do you tell someone when they say, what's the point? You know, Jesus has gone on holiday. You know, God doesn't care. Look at the state of the world. What are you going to answer? God says his word will never return to him empty-handed. As the 
as the, as the rain falls to the earth from heaven and waters the ground and produces a crop, so my word will not return to me empty-handed, but will accomplish the purpose for which I sent it. Right? Jesus says, I am telling you these things now so that when they happen, you will not be shaken. God has given us the law and the prophets. The prophets that Jesus confirmed were telling the truth tell us everything that's going to happen. And guess what's on that list? A multitude of false prophets and false teachers appearing. Lawlessness becoming the normal. When all that happens, what do you tell yourself? God's gone on holiday? No, God was telling the truth. Everything that is happening is exactly what he said will happen. And Jesus isn't just correct about what is horrible. He's correct about the rest of the story as well. Those who persevere to the end will be saved and inherit the kingdom. We stop ourselves being disillusioned. Remember what I was talking to you about dominionist churches that build people up? There's this great expectation, and then when what Jesus says happens instead, they'll come crashing down because it's the opposite of what they've been told to expect. Their faith will blow into dust, right? But Jesus doesn't want that for his disciples, so he warned us in advance. Through the prophets and himself and his apostles, he tells us over and over. That's why when you read the epistles, there's so much reference to the last days, telling the churches. The Spirit expressly says, for instance, Timothy, the Spirit expressly says that in the end of days men will not put up with sound teaching, but they will get for themselves. Teachers who hear what their itching ears want to hear, right? We see that happening now. You say, oh, has Jesus lost it? Is Jesus defeated? No, no, he warned us 2,000 years ago this is exactly what would happen. How did he know? Well, he's God. What did he say about it? What did the apostles say about it? Because what the apostles said about it is what God was saying. He says, be warned. Don't be dismayed. Don't be put off. And for goodness sake, don't join that. But don't be dismayed when you see it because these things must happen before the end. All this terrible stuff must happen and then the end will come. Those who refuse to be scattered, those who hold tightly to my word, who will not follow another. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, my sheep hear my voice. They will not listen to another. Right? The voice of God is the word of God. The scripture, the scripture, the scripture. The word, the word, the word. How you treat the word is how you're treating Jesus. He is the word incarnate, right? That's what stops us being shaken. That's what stops us being scattered. Fellowship, all the more important as the day grows short. Being good shepherds to each other and to those who are missing, by example. Helping each other keep your feet clean, right? And when the bad stuff happens, understanding that, well, it has to happen. Jesus isn't coming back until it does happen. The promised land is on the other side of the, of the coming of Antichrist. Right? So our job is not to stop it happening, which is lots of churches are, trying, are praying like crazy to stop it happening. Who would want to stop it happening? Only Satan. Because it happening is spells the end of his reign, right? No. We accept the warning that God has given us so that we are not shaken when it happens, that we actually increase our faith to see that Jesus bothered to warn us. So our expectations are real. And as it still won't be comfortable, we still won't like it, but it won't sweep us away because we will know that just as he was right about the, those things, so he is right about the rest, which is our salvation out of it. Let's look. 1 Timothy 4. 
command these things, command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for the believers. So this is washing each other's feet. Set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture. Don't be ashamed of him. To preaching and to teaching, even if it's to your kids, to each other. It's, it's not just about the idiot up the front. Do not neglect your gift. Now, this is, was written to Timothy, so teaching is one of Timothy's gifts, right? This is a general instruction. Do not neglect your gift. Why? Because the body needs all of its parts doing what each part was formed in God's hand to contribute. Do not neglect whatever that is that he has made you to be as part of the whole body ministry. Not everyone is to teach. Not everyone is to heal. Not everyone is to have discernment or, you know, but the body working together has all. The Spirit distributes the gifts amongst the parts of the body according to his will. Corinthians, right? We, none of us have all the gifts. The gift I have will be different from the gift Jokas has, and just as well, right? Because none of us are a 100% reflection of Jesus. I'm just a, a, I'm just a reflection of the edge of his fingernail, just on one finger, you know? I just reflect Jesus in one tiny aspect. But all of us together, reflecting other aspects of him collectively, another reason why we need to be careful of fellowship, is our collective witness is so much more real than any witness we can have as an individual. Does that make sense? And he wants to be seen, he wants to be known. What else does it say? Do not neglect your gift which was given through prophecy when the body of elders laid hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them, so another is priority, so that everyone may see your progress. And now, verse 16, biggie. Watch your own life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, if you do what? You will save both yourself and your hearers. It means the opposite of those girls. Loving the truth, being careful of your doctrine, be careful of your own witness, isn't just having an effect on your own walk in salvation. It means your influence as a shepherd, as someone you may not even know is looking to you, will be toward their salvation also. We are not islands. We, are, we affect each other, either for good or for bad, but the option to not affect each other doesn't exist. So watch your doctrine and your own walk closely because it has a double benefit, not only for yourself, but your neighbour. But your neighbour. Then in 1 Timothy 4 again, back in verse 6, it says, if you point these things out to brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister. And that word there, minister, again, is like a servant, minimum. You'll be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the truths of the faith and of the good teaching you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly which means to be Christ-like. What's that instruction? Don't buy into garbage. Once you know it's garbage, don't buy into it. doesn't matter how popular it gets. I've seen this in the church for 30 years. There's a fad after fad, one kooky thing after another. And because everyone wants to be, you know, going with the crowd, rushing to the next... They embrace one old wives' tale after another, right? Forgetting the, forgetting the actual word in the process. Forgetting the word in the process. You have to train yourself to be godly. What does that mean? If you have to train yourself, 
is any oh, there's, there's lots of sports people amongst us, right? So if you're going to the basketball tournament, if you've been picked for the team, what's going to happen if you get there and you did no training? Is it going to go well? Will you know what to do? Will you be able to contribute? Will you be a positive influence on the team? Right? It'd be like, it'd be as if you picked me for your rugby team. Suicide. <laughs> right? No. For the health of the good of the body, including you, we have to be active participants in our own sanctification. Not just hearers of the word, but doers also, as James teaches us. Train yourself means you have a job. You know? And if it's still not clear, imagine all your friends who are sitting there with a coffee in one hand and a donut in the other hand and with their, with their earbuds in at the office with Facebook on their office computer instead of their work, which is probably describes most of Wellington, right? And they've put on like a stone since COVID. And they go, mate, you, should you be eating that donut? And they go, and they reach in their wallet and they show you their gym membership card. Huh? Talk to me like that. Look, I've got a gym membership card. Oh, do you? What colour is the carpet, the gym? I don't know. I'd have to go there to know that. Oh, you mean, <laughs> you got the card, right? But you don't actually go and train? It's no different. Lots of people have got the church card. They got the church membership card, life membership. But they don't go and train there. Some of them don't even go there. Understand? You have to be... Salvation doesn't happen to you. It happens with you. God makes you the offer and the opportunity and the promise to be actively empower your efforts to be sanctified. But if you won't get up and go, if you think it's just going to happen to you, like you can sit in the office and have a second, a second donut because it's all right because I've got the card, well, you know, you can have a discussion with the diabetes doctor about how well that works out, right? No, we have to be active participants. Last page. I think we're just going to look at two parts. So in John 16, the top one's Matthew 5, but we've covered that heaps already. So John 16, verse 1. All this I've told you so that you will not fall away. Remember what I said before? All this I've told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they're offering a service to God. They'll think they're serving God like those two girls. They think they're on a good thing. That they are coming to, they really think they're coming to bless you, right? They will think they are serving God, but what they're bringing is deadly. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I've told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them, right? So we are to expect this. He's warning us that such people will come. We are to take his view. When you realise that someone's trying to take you from Jesus, but they think they're serving God, you need to see them from the cross. So first, don't be shocked. He's warned us in advance. Don't be shocked. The reason they're doing that, it's not malicious. They don't know that they're agents of darkness. They think they're serving God. They are the first victim of the lie. Right? Yeah, give them a Christ-like response. Treat them as any other unsaved person, even though they're quoting the scripture and talking about Jesus. Give them what an unsaved person needs. The truth. Give them what someone in darkness needs. The light. Show them the way by your example. 
will this automatically save them? No. You are not in control of that. But you are in control of who they meet. You are in control of the response they receive. If they are enslaved to a false Jesus, wouldn't it be nice if they could see the reflection, at least in part, of the real one enough to shake the bars of their prison and that God might keep shaking it until that prison door flies open, right? We don't get to save people, he does, but we get to play our role in it. So we're going straight down to the bottom now to finish. There's some other stuff you can read at home, none of it's complex. 1 Corinthians 10. No temptation is overtaking you except what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, in other words, when you're, you are on the point of failing, if you're his disciple, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. God sends you trials to grow you, not to destroy you. Right? So when it gets too bad, he who, he who put you in that trial is just as capable of bringing you right on out of it again. But that promise is only to actual disciples. And the very last one, 2 Timothy 2. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A worker who does not need to be ashamed, who correctly handles the word of truth. Everywhere today and everywhere every day, the heart and at the core of how not to be scattered is you must hold fast to the word, be able to handle the word correctly. So what I'm doing with these two girls takes a particular ability. If you're a, especially if you're watching on TV, if you are not a very mature Christian, don't try this at home. Your enemy there is demonic, not the people. Right, That's why you're a body. So unless you are called to deal directly with such people, what should you do? Go tell your pastors. Go have your youth group or whatever. Pray for those people. So the first thing is protect the flock. Right? So that's the sword being swung that way. Unless you are someone like me, you shouldn't take this on yourself but you should take it on as a body. So that's what the street church did last year. They even went to the press. They even put adverts in the newspaper. They made it widely known and warned all the churches about the threat. And then what did they do? They created a special ministry, which is still going, for people who are coming out of that cult. Right? So it's not enough just to protect the flock. You want to punish Satan by ha- to, ha- taking his slaves off and making them children of the living God, right? So the street set an excellent example of what to do as a body ministry, okay? And I would say that particularly to women because uh, you need the, your head covered, right? So a situation like that, you should... Bring it back to the body as quickly as possible. Don't fly alone. Shouldn't fly alone in it anyway. In fact, even me sharing it with you there's, is me not flying alone, right? So we're finished now. Please keep, you don't need to know their names. You just need to know they exist. Please ask the Lord to bring as many out as possible. I guess especially these two, since they are the two that came. But all... The old boy is 93, and I don't imagine he will last much longer, you know. And that's the kind of cult that maybe it will disintegrate when he dies because it's very centred on him, but we can't bank on it. So let's just be praying, and we'll finish in prayer now. Father, we bless you. We thank you for warning us in advance. Above all and most of all, Lord, though, we thank you that you are able to save what is not possible for us is possible for you. Nothing is too hard for you. Mercy triumphs over justice. So, Lord, first of all, thank you for protecting us by giving us 
early advance. You are the shepherd who protects the flock. But it's not enough for us to be protected, Lord. Grateful as we are. We pray, Lord, for the kind of vengeance that we want concerning the attack. We want vengeance against the true enemy, which is not these humans, but what enslaves them. Avenge us, Lord, by saving them. Avenge us by taking Satan's slaves away from him and turning them to yourself. They are like Nicodemus, Lord. They are so close to the kingdom. It's only that man's lies that are keeping them from you. So I pray, Lord, that you would pour out your fury on the lies and on the spirits concerned, but the humans that are enslaved, especially like these girls that are so close, Lord, that you would bring them over and push aside what's keeping them from you and make yourself known to them in a way that they can trust because it's you yourself. We pray in Jesus' name, not just for them, but for all around the world in the same kind of situation. We pray for our brothers and sisters everywhere in such times, Lord, that you would cause them to stand, empower them to stand, especially those who have no fellowship, who are wandering alone. And since the church is so dangerous, Lord, raise up new wineskins and appoint over them those you've trained, those you've prepared. Make places of refuge for the lambs to regather. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. That's it for the week. God bless.